Welcome back to KC Cares, Kansas City's nonprofit digital resource. And we are so honored to have the new mayor of Kansas City, Quentin Lucas. The last time I saw you, you weren't mayor. No. You were city council, which of course is very important. It was a fun position, but this is even more fun now. Uh, I and, get uh, more fun now that the election is over. Oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. A few more complaints Crazy. though every day too. But well, it goes but with the But a few territory. more staff to handle it. Ain't you don't have to truth. take all the calls, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. I love Carlotta. I, I She's finally wonderful. found her. You have a wonderful person in her. She's, She's been very good to me. And now person. with like eight other people to help, it gets even she better. She doesn't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're delighted to have you here. And I know there's many issues in the city and all of that. But we wanted to focus kind of on how the mayor's office and the mayor, you know, work with nonprofits and, and what the role is in a city of this size. Absolutely. You know, I, I think there are a few different things that it's important for us to remember. The first is so many people talk to us every day in City Hall about what are you doing about violent crime? What are you doing about housing? What are you doing about mental health? Largely, the answer is there are lots of nonprofits that are working in all of those spaces. So I see my job as really enhancing all of them, connecting more people, being as supportive as possible, and frankly, making sure the public recognizes a lot of the outstanding resources we have in Kansas City. So that's probably a step one for me. Step two is saying how where the city is already engaged in some areas, can we be good allies for people that are there now? When you think of the public safety conversation, for example, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we see a lot of violence. How do we make sure that folks who need mentoring from those who are survivors of sexual assault to crime victims to so many others can actually know that there are resources for you? So being that connector is key, too. So it really is kind of an all of the above. And, and certainly, and I'll say this, the city, um, Jackson County, and frankly, every county from anywhere that's watching any of this can see often that we're funders of these sorts of organizations too. So how do we make sure we're responsible, we're keeping folks accountable, but we're also looking for new opportunities in Kansas City all the time. So it's that mix. And, and for me, it's kind of about knowing uh, who's doing what, staying engaged, listening, keeping my ear to the ground, seeing where we need more help and attention and making sure I'm showing up to give it. While there's government dollars that pay, of course, yeah. into running the government and city council, you're quasi nonprofit in and of yourselves. Yeah. You're doing, I don't, I don't want to call it charitable work, necessary work, yeah. but to, to make a community function. How do you stay on track? I know it's been a short yeah. while, but I'm sure you've given some thought to it. Is how do you keep on track and, and pulling the right people to the table. Well, you know, one month in uh, the mayor's seat feels like three years. So I, <laughs> fortunately- You I was, don't look any older. <laughs> exactly, I haven't lost any hair. Nope, you have Fortunately, haven't. right? I started that way. But, um, you know, for me, I think one way that we, we have to balance it is by making sure we're listening and relying on data to really inform, I think, a lot of the steps that we're taking. You know, one of the greatest challenges I've seen both in government, but frankly, the nonprofit space is a lot of us have world views that are too frozen on what we grew up with or what we knew. And I learned that even in my position. I grew up experiencing homelessness. And so sometimes I said, this is what homelessness in youth looks like. But frankly, it's not the same as it was in 1995, even though that wasn't that long ago. Uh, and it's really making sure that you stay informed, that you're listening. And more than anything, particularly with young people, to make sure that we're still kind of reaching out, understanding what, what they react to. A lot of our kind of safe opportunities for kids had all these programs when I got into office. And, and frankly, I know it's something my predecessor worked on, too, which were based on what we thought kids liked doing from the 80s, from the 90s. Mm -hmm. What is it that they're into now? How do we make sure we're reaching whatever activities are intriguing to them? And so it's more of that sort of work, educating ourselves every day and not just saying we have a program, we fund it each year, um, we just have to keep funding it. In some ways you have to rock the boat and that's what makes you better in government, although certainly mm. you can annoy a lot of people because yep. as you know, if a nonprofit's been doing the same thing every year and lots of people watching I know experience this, and then you change it up one year, people say, but wait, you're supposed to do a gala and then you do this other thing yeah. and that's, that's what this is about. It's changing it, it's challenging it, and the city needs to do that as well. You mentioned growing up you were homeless. Yeah. Can you share a little bit of that journey with us? Yeah. And were there 
organizations that helped your family or, or was that yeah. before there was a robust number that are out there now? You know, I think there is a much better, there's a much better network now. There were organizations there. Um, and frankly, one thing that I think I've seen as a positive since the 20th century, it's weird to think about it that way, is we've always had some very helpful organizations, but so much of our society until I think probably the last 10 to 15 years was had things so black and white. You were homeless or you weren't. They weren't thinking about people who were coming in and out of homelessness. You're a criminal or you're not. You're a, a patient or you're not, right? And frankly, what we've seen in some ways in the positive from outpatient care and medicine to how we treat counseling to any number of things is understanding that people deal with issues, but not all the time. We weren't homeless all the time. Mm -hmm. We ran into tough periods. And so there'd be a few months of staying in a by-the-night motel. Um, and I don't think there really were that many services that were filling that breach back then. I think we do better with that now. Um, in terms of, yeah, memories I have, you know, one of the funniest ones I always share goes to show you how kids, they're kind of smart or not, depends on your mm -hmm. views sometimes. But I still remember, you know, so we had nowhere to live. We found this motel somewhere randomly. And uh, I was so excited because they did have cable. Ooh. And I was like, oh my God, I can watch this new show. Or so I thought, Sports Center every night. And I'm going to like track the Chiefs as they go to the Super Bowl, which, you know, I'm still waiting about 26 yeah, waiting, years but later. But, you know, crossed. that was cool. And I remember another one. We were staying uh, with my great aunt. She was 82 at the time. I was probably seven or eight. Um, and my sisters were farmed out to live somewhere else here in town. And then my mother and I stayed with my great aunt. And the thing I'll remember for the rest of my life was during the summer, it was great with a great aunt, not because she spent much time with me, because when her stories were on, and I was like, she watched all of them. Mm -hmm. So from about 10 a.m. until 3 p.m., you know, I couldn't do anything with her. But I still remember like when the news would come on, I could like spend 30 minutes with her and she would cook a hot dog in the microwave for about three minutes. <laughs> and so we had these strips of bacon, basically. Um, that made for an interesting time, but it was, oh, wow. you know, but I remember some of those. You certainly remember the challenge, but um, for me, what's been important is actually understanding, you know, how do I make it so somebody who's going through that now, particularly in those transitional areas, know there's someone for them. That person who's dealing with PTSD, let's say, from whatever situation, know that there's something there for them. And frankly, that's what I think we're all doing a lot better at now. You've had experience in nonprofits. You've served yes. on boards. Yes, what are some of the lessons that you've taken away from those experiences? And how can you use them yeah. as mayor? You know, one of them is never forget the core mission of what you're doing. It is so easy in all of our lives, right, to mm -hmm. just get busy. And you get bogged down with everything under the sun. And, and for example, you're trying to plan the gala or you're trying to do who knows what. Remembering why you're there is really what energizes you. It's what's energized me in local government. It's, re it's what's energized me in, in my nonprofit volunteering and board membership. You know, a few years back, I was teaching in, in prisons. So I taught at the Kansas State Penitentiary at Lansing. Wow. And my goal there was to tell, I mean, for those who don't know, most of our prisoners are coming right back home and they get paroled home. Um, and my goal there was to just say, look, somebody cares about you. Somebody values you. And I think if we can remember that in everything, every organization that we have, everything we do, that's been key for me. But another thing is for anyone, whether a nonprofit is your full-time job, you're a donor, you're a volunteer, um, the stuff you do really matters. It matters a lot. And so never see it as an aside. You know, when I was doing my, my classes at the prison, that was more important to me than my legal work each week. Probably why I don't practice law that much anymore. <laughs> right? But, uh, you know, and I think that is the sort of thing that one has to always remember. I don't know if our listeners realize and our, our viewers, you have something in common with the Kansas 3rd District Congresswoman. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Trivia? Yeah, it's good trivia. Uh, Sharice and I went to Cornell Law School together, and my favorite thing was, it's not like we just went, but actually we knew each other, we're friends, and you know the funniest thing, um, when she started running in this race, the mayor's race somehow lasted so long that I feel like she was running the same time I was for right, a little while, right. and um, I went over some of our old emails, 
And I won't give away too much other than to know <laughs> that we used to catch up. We, we both moved back to Kansas City after law school. Uh, she finished school a year after me. But probably once every month or two, we would grab dinner. And then we wrote these just fascinating, back, I guess, when you weren't on social media all the time. Right. Um, we had time to actually write real emails and good messages to each other. So it's been neat kind of thinking about where that friendship has gone. Seeing her excel uh, has been one of the more exciting things that I've seen. I'm proud of, proud of the Kansas 3rd District. Um, but at the same time, I'm just proud of my friend who has pushed through with people telling her, oh, you can't win for this reason or that reason. And I think she's shown us something very different. So I, she's a mentor to me as well. You also have another thing in common, both the Congresswoman and yourself, you've been active in nonprofits. Yeah. I mean, she served yeah, as a fellow. Absolutely. We had her on the show not terribly long ago and talked about her take was that when you've got that background, you at least know how to pull those people to the table. In a Lucas administration, mm -hmm. granted, you're only a few months in, right. how are you going to are you going to do something like that? Is that a possibility? Yeah. A nonprofit cabinet? Well, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that, so to the Congresswoman's first point, she's a thousand percent right, which is you never forget the struggle. You never forget where you're from and you never forget how important the issues are for you. And for me, in terms of how we engage in nonprofits, it'll be multifaceted. I've usually addressed it so far in my month, <laughs> <laughs> issue by issue. And one issue that I'm thinking a lot about right now is gun violence, crime, yeah. victims' rights. Um, and it is, and it has been, you know, there's an organization, an outstanding one, Healing Pathways, that works with uh, children of homicide victims. And I've tried to make sure, one, that I'm showing up, but two, that I am making an opportunity for them, as we're talking about big public policy issues, that they're playing some role within it. Because I want to make sure that, that they actually are the ones that are helping inform policy every step of the way, too. So I'm going to steal, steal the congresswoman's idea and probably just establish a cabinet, too. I'm probably going to make sure it's focused really issue by issue. So as we're dealing with public health issues, violence issues, which are kind of the same, um, any housing issues, that we're actually addressing that in each step. And importantly, that city organizations that work in those areas, the Housing Authority, for example, has probably thousands of people on vouchers every day in Kansas City. Lots of those families are the types of folks that deal with food insecurity, with employment insecurity. How can we make it so we're really doing that linkage that the city's in a good position to do? I don't know how you find time to do anything <laughs> anymore because it, you go from being a councilman to being the mayor, lots of people pulling at your time, et cetera. Are you, are you finding people are open to conversation? You know, when you've had a long administration, yeah. I often wonder about that. You know, I was exceedingly nervous about that because I was, I was following a popular mayor. I think people, if they were, in fact, I had polls that said right track, wrong track. People generally liked the track Kansas City was on. We're far from perfect, but they were saying, we, we like how things are going. And so I thought, oh my goodness, what does that mean for me? Well, they say, who's the new guy? Who's the imposter? The same <laughs> thing we've all been scared of since we were fourth graders, right? That somebody will find you out. Um, and I have been so pleasantly surprised by our community, not just those who live in Kansas City, Missouri, but those all around our region. I gave a talk in Lenexa, Kansas, probably about a month ago, where there were people that were really excited and wanted to share ideas. And so that's the biggest aid of all. I realize that I can't figure everything out. My staff, even if it's the most brilliant, and we have some good people, um, but we can't figure it out. It really takes the community. And that has both informed me, but that's also energized me tremendously. That's how you get up every day way too early in the morning and have a chance to say, all right, I'm ready to take this on again. And frankly, even in our darkest days so far in my term as mayor, and, and I'll be honest, you know, the unacceptable amount of violence in our community pains me greatly. And I think it's our gravest challenge. Um, but I've been so heartened by all the people that say, no, 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 we care. You know, when you're getting an email from somebody in, in Topeka or somebody from Liberty who's saying, hey, I just want to do whatever I can to help. I have no idea what I can do. You know, that actually kind of energizes you too. And that's, I think, speaks highly of the community that we're in. You mentioned speaking in Lenexa. You have your colleague yeah. and your former classmate yeah. who's in the Congress. Yeah. How do you 
see maybe extending beyond these boundaries yeah. of, you know, we're in Kansas City, Missouri at the right. Plaza Library, but right. well, you know, is that a view for you? Isn't that the, one of the oddest things about getting into <clears throat> politics is that it's the first time in your life you see the boundaries, whereas almost none of the rest of us do. And maybe it's because I went to grade and high school on the state line, so that already kind of makes the boundaries blurry. But every person, right? If you need, to, if you go, got to go buy some shoes, right? You're just going to go to the store that has them. If you're looking for this resource, you go somewhere. If you're going to a game, you go there. I think it's important for all of us, particularly in local government, but also state government. We've seen some progress with our governors of late. Need to recognize that, yeah, nobody else is living by those boundaries, right? Everybody is looking for how do we have the best community possible. And that's what I've seen as my charge, too. The best Kansas City, Missouri is a Kansas City, Missouri that has a great Kansas City, Kansas, Lenexa, St. Joseph, right? Has all these opportunities around us, has a great state of Kansas nearby. And I think, frankly, it's vice versa that way. You know, to the Congresswoman's credit, uh, a week or two ago, I, we, spoke, we both spoke at the opening of an all-girls charter school. Right. Um, and it was so cool because what we saw was this group of fifth grade girls, right? And it was probably like 80 of them who were just excited about opportunities. They have no idea who we really were. We were just <laughs> people in suits talking to them. And I think success for our region is if any of those young girls know like all the promise they have, all the opportunity they have, and they can come back to this community or be mentors in this community and make it better, no matter where they put down roots or pay taxes. We hope you will come back often. I'd love to. And we thank everybody else for listening to Casey Cares, Kansas City's nonprofit digital resource. We're produced by Charitable Communications, a nonprofit organization. And Casey Cares is generously underwritten by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. Our podcasts are available at caseycaresonline.org if you want to be a guest or spread the love through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Casey Cares Online. And thank you for listening to Casey Cares on ESPN 1510 and 94.5 FM.